You're listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Here are your hosts, Fran Chismar and Tom Knezic. Welcome back to The Buzz, brought to you by the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Magic Mind and Pinelands Nursery, and I am Fran Chismar. And I'm Tom Knezic. Welcome to episode 135. You threw me off there, little friend, with the and I'm Fran Chismar. I don't know what was going going through your mind, but I I don't think it was magic at that that point in time, but. (laughs) <laughs> i i don't know i i just mm. kind of froze for a second then i kind of felt like you froze and that's why i started I laughing did, yeah, i was like i don't know exactly how to follow that up but um no, I, we're, and i didn't say spanky mcgee yeah nothing yeah we're excited to have everyone back to learn a lot more about native plants and uh yes. and have some some fun banter and uh keep it light and, and casual f- for the next hour ish i agree i agree and it's we're I'm kind of throwing. This is the time of the year that we get thrown off because we have to record multiple episodes coming up to holidays and trade shows mm-hmm. and and just you're finally getting a chance to go on your vacation. Yeah, when this airs, yeah. you're on your. Hopefully, you're on your vacation. I will be on time. a boat. We said um, that before. Leaving the Caribbean uh, for for real this time. Yes, unless there's a, a weird hurricane that just pops up, which is <laughs> last time when we did That's this. What it happened. was it was on Saturday. It was like. Oh crap! There's a hurricane. Potentially, it was a tropical. It wasn't even actually. It wasn't even a tropical storm at that point. Yeah, but there was a lot of. I'm a dad now for the last two and a half years. Dad of two and a half years here, right. and um, I thought you were going to say two and a half kids. I'm a dad of two and a half two kids. And, a half years. and, uh, and uh, yeah, it's something there a, a switch flicks when you become a dad, and uh, you're yeah. obsessed with the weather. So I was. Yes. I'm obsessed. I follow a lot of weathermen on on twitter and i have <laughs> you have multiple no, weather no, apps. how many weather apps do you think i have on my phone <laughs> i have two i'm gonna say that <laughs> which you is have still one more than most most people, people. Have, i'm gonna say you have four i've got to actually check All right. uh, um, while you're doing that i'm gonna share a quick funny story so uh my best friend from high school was also uh, uh my best man he went he has four children and they wouldn't allow their first couple children to watch tv commercials they always kept the weather channel on the last channel on the remote so that if a commercial came on they would flip over to to the weather channel Mm -hmm. so i'm trying to remember how old his kids were he had three of the four at that point and i was over there with a group of people and they gave us the remote we were watching something like please do me a favor like if the commercial comes Mm -hmm. on just hit last yeah and we we're sitting there, and a commercial came on, and we hit the last button to the Weather Channel. And his son was like, "Oh man, you watch the weather too?" <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's um. So I did I did a quick count, and right. you know how on the iPhone you can like categorize apps, and you put have them, them in, in folders folder? and all yeah. that. So I actually have a weather folder, and um. And in that folder, there are six different weather apps. Oh, all right. Let me look. Now, I, that being said, I actually just downloaded a new one, which I really love, called Windy. And um, so I have seven on my phone. But one of them I don't use often, so it actually, like, de-downloaded from my phone. Right. And uh, I, I'm looking because I actually have a weather folder also. Mm-hmm. I have four weather apps. Yeah. But one really is nothing more than a photo app that incorporates where you're at in the weather. Yep. So I'm not counting that one. It's really I have three. Yeah. But it was it was funny a month ago when we were originally going to go on this cruise. Um and I've mentioned I'm not a first time cruiser going yes. on this cruise and uh and not necessarily what I'd consider a dream vacation, but I think it makes a lot of sense for what we wanted like with yes. where we are in our lives. And um so I saw this storm brewing. I was reading on Twitter about this storm brewing and uh I texted a friend of mine who lives in Florida. And said, "Hey, when you're going to the Bahamas, what what weather app do you use? Okay, because some stuff's oh, more localized. Yeah, that's true. You go to the National Weather Service stuff. It's you can find different localized sites that'll give you good information. He's like, oh yeah, I use this app called Windy. This is like a f- completely free ad for Windy. Okay, so I download. I'm like, oh, this is awesome because it shows you wind speeds, wind gusts. It'll show oh, you nice. waves. It'll give you actual forecast stuff. Yeah. It, there's a lot of practical applications there. Like this is this is it, friend. It's like it's oh, wow. a lot of yeah. it's a big radar." Yeah. A lot of motion. There's you can a lot scroll of, way a lot in of advance. Info. Yeah. And then um 
So the cruise line we were on actually has its own like meteorologist that also oh, has a really? big tr- Twitter presence. So I started following him on Twitter. And then he's putting up, and he used this exact same app I use, oh, this Windy app. I'm like, I knew this was the right decision. This is a good app. I really love it um, as a as a weather dad. And um, I think you it, know, there's a lot of people out there. Like dad jokes have become a thing. Yes, and there's a lot of people that try and tell dad jokes even though they're not dads. Yes, that's what you call a faux pas. Oh, <laughs> oh, I I wish I had the the sad trombone <laughs> queued up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I fell mm. for that one. Uh, well, I hope you get to go this time. Yeah. It looks like you're leaving behind cold, rainy, possibly yeah, snowy weather nice. here. So it's you're getting away at the perfect time. The weather has been so – we hit cold and then we got warm and now we're – what was it? 20-some degrees. 22 this, 20 this, morning, this morning. So, But um, yeah, no, it's so, – uh, so we're recording a little early just we, so we – because I'm – like we said, I'm not going to be here to record next week. Um, but – I'm hoping I can read a couple books and it'll be great. Relax. Speaking of books, you had just bought Greg Tepper's new book for the office. You did, yeah. And then, can you remind me the name of that? I don't want to miss. It is. Uh, oh, it's right here. Okay. It's Deer Resistant, Deer Deer Resistant Deer Native Plants yeah. uh, for the Northeast. And, and I, the, just, <clears throat> I, I just want to point out after reading that over the Thanksgiving holiday that Greg does have a list of what he considers deer candy. Mm-hmm. And that was a question, kind of a question, not in the Greg's list, episode, in the trivia yeah. episode, but he did list Junipers virginiana as his list of deer most favorite plants, and yeah. that was something that both Daryl and I had as an answer, but yeah. were wrong. So I just wanted to... Well, I was using the, the National Deer Association's article that I, yes. that I chose. Yes. And, um, just wanted to... Ba- not that it would have given me the win, but it yeah. would have been another answer. Correct. Yeah, and I... I I don't know how I feel about it. <laughs> so I, this is the list of, of deer candy. And, the again, the book is called uh, Deer Resistant Native Plants from the Northeast. It's by Ruth Rogers Clausen and Greg D. Tepper. And Greg's and, a um, former guest Greg was on. Ours. Yeah, and he's at um, – I just talked about the cemetery uh, the other day. Laurel. Uh, West Laurel, Laurel Hill, Hill Cemetery where they have Nature Sanctuary. Really and they're cool. actually Something expanding we Nature Sanctuary. There's big expansion going on. Um, but – and, and there's other copies of this. People are dying to get into that it. I think. <laughs> good. And that's, a, that's not a faux pas, Grant, for him. That's, that's, a, that's a, the real deal. Genuine dad joke right there. <laughs> so, uh, um, but Ruth Rogers Clausen has copies of this book for other regions of the country, too. Um, oh, I didn't know that. I okay. think Greg just hel- helped out on this one. I don't know if he helped out on every one that they have. So if you're in... The southwest or southeast or northwest, there may be a copy of this book for you as well. If if you don't own that book, I will say this. It is an A to Z, which I don't always love, but in this instance, I love it because when I'm thinking of deer resistance, that's I, I want it like an encyclopedia almost. Yeah. And and that's what it is. And a lot of great information. Oh, you know, I really could have done this. We we could call this our Grow Read a book if you just want to hit the jingle real quick. But okay. um Oh, shoot. Or you can play to the crickets. It's <laughs> Wait, up to you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope that was a sporadic. Uh... <laughs> that, that was... <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's going to be one of those. Yep. You know, I forgot that I had turned off the uh, – I had turned off our soundboard and then turned it back on. So let me give you that jingle. Grow me a book. Yeah, so it's I, – I felt that it was a lot of great information that you don't necessarily have to take in all at once, but you can use it as a reference book. It's one of those mm-hmm. things that I could easily have on my desk and be able to pick up and say I need you know a couple quick references or I need to check this plant. Um, let me Let me go to it. And there was a lot of fantastic information that way, very practical information that I think anyone can use. Um, and and again, I, I just think it's one of those things. Keep on your desk. Keep on yeah, your. Yeah, it's it's one. Keep it after talking to Greg and knowing this book was coming out, um, I simply just forgot to purchase it earlier. And then I was like, oh yeah, I need to buy this book. So I went and got it off Amazon. It was there the next day. And um, but one of the things that's really important about it is early on, it just has common features of deer resistant plants: fuzzy leaves, tough and leathery fibrous leaves, aromatic leaves, aromatic flowers, spines and bristles, poisonous compounds. 
that's the kind of things when people ask us this question, we're on the phone or through email, that like that's kind of the rules of thumb yeah. that we follow. Yes. We don't know the specifics. So it's nice to have a resource that kind of gives you yes. some specifics. I agree. Now, going back to the Janupas, Virginia, yeah. and the Eastern Red Cedar, um, well, I'll read the whole list of Deer Candy native Let's plants. Say top 20? Is it the top 20? There's, uh, there's or, maybe 15, 15 things here. Okay. Um, Red bud or eastern red bud, lady slipper, wild geranium, alum root, smooth hydrangea, uh, juniper, lily, Canada mayflower, native crab apple, native phlox, native deciduous azalea, elderberry, snowberry, eastern arbor variety, and trillium are what they have as yeah. lists as deer candy here. And I agree with right. a lot of that. I agree. And I think that's the reason why a lot of those things you don't, they're mm-hmm. native here and you don't see them <laughs> yeah. because they're deer candy. Now, I wish I had looked this up beforehand, but. My argument with the eastern red cedar, and probably the well, I have, some of our varieties I know yeah. are really attractive deer, yeah. and some of them aren't as attractive deer. But the eastern red cedar, I remember in my freshman year biology class, we had a lab, and the professor was talking about eastern red cedar and how it had no nutritional value for deer. Yeah. But if you went and found deer that died of starvation in the winter, you would and you opened them up, yeah. you would see their bellies were stuffed with eastern red cedar. Yeah. And it was just because that was they didn't have anything else to eat, and they would just browse and browse and browse. My guess is why, and why eastern red cedar is on that list. It's probably not because they it attracts deer and deer yeah. like it a lot, but it's a one that's it's commonly in used. It's in abundance. It's commonly used in the landscape trade, and it's really obvious when a deer's eating it. Yeah, because a it lot looks of the like other like if you, yeah. by burning them, paid them is something deer really like too. Yeah. And you know, well, I shouldn't say you know, you don't see the viburnum then tame because they're eating when they're six inches tall. Exactly. This is something that gets a little bigger and, okay, the deer don't have anything left. I think they're, this is my they, hypothesis. Yeah. Is that in the, and the keys in on it, the deer, tree's not dead. I see all kinds of little eastern red cedars in the woods that are anywhere from six inches to three feet tall, and they aren't nibbled at all. No, when you notice is <clears> when they're already above six foot. Yep. Say they're ten foot tall, they've eaten the bottom six foot of it. So it looks like a lollipop. Yeah. But if you were to count, like to drive down a road or walk through an area and count how many have been eaten, browsed, or mm-hmm. how many haven't, you could it, it'd be pretty close. I I'd say. Yeah. But you're yeah. right. They 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 had to have already gotten to that height unbrowsed, mm-hmm. or they wouldn't have made it. Yep. yep. So it's after the fact that it's. Food and I'm even thinking there. there's a spot in the woods that I I've, I've been to, and it's it's pretty cool because you almost have just like a four foot canopy of eastern red cedar everything below that's been browsed off okay and like you i have the crotch but you can just walk right underneath of it but they're obviously they got to that point but and this is a like it's not a wild stand but it's a it wasn't planted um so i guess that would make it a wild stand it was wow. self-propagated i guess i should yeah. say it wasn't planted there but it wasn't like it was always been there yes. so these things grew up there and formed this thicket um, but they got to that point. So I think it's yeah. my hypothesis is it's not the first thing deer see, seek out, but when they don't have anything else to eat, they eat it. They eat and it. it's very obvious that they eat it. I was, I so. was actually thinking about Marcus Gray the other day and Christmas trees yeah. because someone had posted on LinkedIn that their nursery was producing, it was that time of the year and they're producing potted Christmas mm-hmm. trees to take home. And it was all Eastern red cedar. And it yep. was it, it was in I think it was in Texas. So I was like, wow, look at that! Like yep. not not something that here in the Northeast anyone thinks about yeah. taking into their house. And that's a good segue, Fran, because my that's hot has something to do with with Christmas this year. Oh. So let's get into the plants we're vibing this week and kick it to the last. That's hot. <clears throat> that well, why don't twister. you why don't you go for the segue yeah. then? So as you can see from your your sheet that we have here, Fran, I don't have a plant there. You don't. Um, I had an incredibly busy week. I was all over the place. You were. Pulling my hair out. You're going to be um, busy when you get back to And it. literally just pulled this plant. Uh, I'm just like thinking of what did I see this week that caught my eye or conversations I had. And um, I was at the New Jersey Nursery and Landscape Association dinner last night talking to another board member, uh, Steve Wagner. Oh, yes. And he's asking about some pitch pines we were growing. I'm like, that's going to be my plant. Oh, and um, nice choice. Now, I probably wouldn't recommend putting pitch pine in your house for a Christmas tree. Unless you like taking acid <laughs> and, and want to have that sensation all the time, even when you aren't, <laughs> aren't high as a balloon. Well, um, I, I would say the 
a good reason to not use it is it doesn't like to be harvested in no. in the fall, and you're going to get a lot of needle drop. But if you're getting them container grow, yeah. you might like, you know. Yeah, it's got it's kind of like it's like maybe a doctor it's more Seuss. of like a it's yeah like Doctor Seussish. If if Doctor Seuss was a member of the Grateful Dead, <laughs> then that might have been the, the, the Christmas tree that that he Listen, chose. Having been um, old enough to attend Grateful Dead yeah. concerts. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. I've never Doc- been I've never really been a Grateful Dead fan. I'm really just playing off the the stereotype. I do enjoy their music, but I don't seek out their music. What I guess year were you I'm born? 89. Okay. So up until like the time you were 5, yeah. you could have gone. Yeah. No, what's been. what's interesting for not to get too far off topic is yeah. my wife Melissa, favorite band is Dave Matthews Band. Yes. Didn't even know really much about the Grateful Dead other than she heard of them and then it just came up on like a Spotify playlist for her and now she loves the Grateful Dead. Yeah. And um, says maybe even more than Dave Matthews Band. She's just really? big into like the the jam really? band. She likes type stuff. Jam. Well, to me, Grateful Dead. There's a there's something for everyone. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, between the the different songwriters, I think that you can like Jerry stuff. You can like Bob yep. stuff. You there's there's a whole different. You know, there's short songs. There's long songs. Yep. There's a little something for everyone. I don't know, but that's yeah. interesting. That that gives us yeah. a little common ground. Yeah, but anyway, not, not back to the band. the Pitch Pines. Um, so pitch pine or, or pinus rigida is uh, is native to New Jersey. It's commonly found in the New Jersey pine barrens. Um, actually, probably the dominant tree in the New Jersey pine barrens. It's a medium sized evergreen conifer uh, and features a, a regular form, which is why I make the the acid and, and grateful yeah. dead jokes um, because it's like it's funky. It's it it's curling all over the place. It's a it's a really cool looking tree. Uh, it's really popular for bonsai. When yes. people use bonsai for with native plants, um, because it kind of has that funky form, Regular. and you can get some really cool twists and turns. And um, now, it, I don't know if you have it up or if you know off the top of your head. I'm trying to remember. Is it a three needle pine or a two needle pine? Uh, let me see here. I see. I always forget that, and I'm looking to see if it's on this sheet. And I, I don't see it on Jersey Friendly Yards, um, at least right. quickly, but. Something that has extreme fire tolerance, the the pine cones actually open with um, need fire or heat to open. So what we do to get the seeds out is usually we'll throw them in the oven or the Sometimes microwave. The microwave. Yeah. And um, pitch pine is three three, needle, okay. three needles. Yeah, and um, so I'm probably going to use some as like a privacy hedge in a way. I don't really know if I I haven't completely sold myself on that yet, but because uh, it's more of a. a a scrub pine, yeah, and it it does tend to not keep its branches lower. Yeah, that's um, true. And I don't know. I think there's a reason why it hasn't been used. Yeah, as yeah. A I'm just scene. thinking. I I have these um, Norway spruce that look terrible, <laughs> and yeah. and I'm like, well, they already look bad. This will look better than that, even though it's not the ideal thing. Yeah. And uh, so I'm like, I keep going back and forth on what am I going to use here and and that's also a native plant. I haven't quite decided yet. All right. Eastern red cedar would be the easy solution, but I don't necessarily want to do that. I'll, I'm not, I don't know. I'm, yeah, I haven't I'm, sold myself on that either. No. But anyway, why I bring it up and relate it to Christmas is it's a really makes a really cool like native plant wreath. And if you saw my TikTok and Instagram reel video about Thanksgiving and making little, little, um, Thanksgiving centerpieces are using native plants that are dried out or gone to seed and that kind of stuff. I love making centerpieces and um, I shouldn't say I love making them. I love seeing them when they're made out of native plants yeah. and like in forged materials in a way. So you go and like you collect some branches and, and make a wreath using pitch pine boughs and pine mm-hmm. cones and, and that kind of stuff. I'm winterberry holly. I really like seeing that kind of stuff. So as you're entering our holiday season mm-hmm. and you want to, have like a, a thematic seasonal centerpiece or wreath or something like that. Think about using some native materials. That's actually a good segue into my article this week, but I still have to give you my my plant pick this week. So I'm going with strawberry bush, or it's also called mm-hmm. bursting heart, which is Euonymus americanus. And I know a, a few episodes ago I mentioned that we came across this stand uh, wild, which I think it's the first time I'd ever seen it because um, it's not. I, I don't think common. I've ever seen it. I know it's. Russ Fenari's favorite plant. Yeah. Um, and really where where Russ is, it's the northernmost 
part really is central New Jersey. So mm-hmm. we're hitting that limit. It's it's central New Jersey to Florida, west of Texas. It's a facultative uh, plant, uh, which means 33 to 66 percent of the time it's found in wetlands. Uh, it can get up to 12 foot. The, the plants that I saw were around six foot tall, not not very robust. Uh, they have green to purple blooms March through August. And then it takes part shade and moist soil. Uh, where I had seen it, it was kind of like lakeside or marsh side. Um, and from wildflower.org, uh, their description is its ridge twigs become purplish when exposed to the sun. Pale green flowers with purple stamens have five distinct clawed petals. Uh, bright green oval leaves become dark red in fall when uh, bright red fruits open to reveal orange seeds. So I just happened to see them in seed. Actually, my wife. Agatha just – she's the one that noticed it. I would have walked right by, and we went back. Uh, strawberry bush is a member of the bittersweet family, uh, which is uh, Calistraceae, uh, which includes shrubs, woody vines, and mostly small trees. So, yeah. Um, but two great choices. I think it's going to be a lot easier to find pitch pine uh, than it is going to find Euonymus americanus. Um but two great choices. They're a little more specific. Make sure you're aware of the area. Uh, pitch pines mainly are pine barren pines, mm-hmm. so it's sandy, sandy or not well, well, I guess well drained. It's drier. So. Yeah, yep. They're yeah, they're going to want to be a so, drier location. Yeah. So, but if if you have an opportunity and you have those conditions, make sure you get them. I think both great choices. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. You, you want to do this or that? Yeah, let's do it. You can do with this. Or you can do with that. So we do have a winner. So the articles last week, I had the article about um, native lawns in Florida, and you had the article about human nutrient inputs that alter grasslands, which, wow, I thought that really tied in with with last week's episode oh, yeah. of uh, – with Dr. Peter Groffman. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but we, that, How fun was that? Man, that you was... know what? That was one of – my favorite episodes, and yeah. I'm so happy that he has agreed to come on for a second part, mm-hmm. and that will actually be next next week's episode. So oh, yeah. I'm I'm excited about that. But uh, we do have a winner on those two articles, and the winner is I won eleven to nine. Now I did notice that people were able to vote for both articles. Oh oh, you want to know what it is? What's that? So there's a toggle. When you select this stuff that I found after I'd been posting it for a while that you can toggle on and off if people can vote for multiples or, or, yeah, vote for multiple things or add their own choice. And you have to select that they can't. Okay. Now that we have someone new posting this, they didn't which is, does a really good job of making yes. sure this comes out on time and is regular. Yes. <laughs> yes. Regular. Yes. Uh, yeah, we probably got to tell them that they, <laughs> there's toggles so they can't vote for both. Yeah. So is this it, is this vote for to subtract it, or is no, this just no? Uh, that's oh. the total. I I call for a recount. Well, they voted for both, so you take them out. Yeah. And I still win by two. Yeah, I don't know about <laughs> that. <laughs> I'm calling. I'm saying there's election fraud here. <laughs> but I will say this: topically, we could. Yeah. I could for my pro protest out of the you, four se- outside of uh, Four Seasons landscape, yeah. and, and it would make sense yes. for our podcast. <laughs> yeah. But um, I will say this though. Good amount of votes in just one week, and a lot of comments that it was two great articles and people really had trouble choosing that we made it difficult for them. So let's try to do that again this week. Um, I'm going to choose to go first since your comment about foraging and the holidays kind of mm-hmm. ties into yeah. my article this week. My article is uh, your wild holiday recipes won it for Maryland cookbook celebrating game fish and native plants, and this is by Kate Ryan on WTOP News. Uh, let me just see how long it is. It's not that long. Um, if your favorite holiday recipe includes some wild ingredients, the Maryland Department of Natural Resources wants to hear from you. The aptly named Megan McGinn Meals, the public information officer for DNR, is compiling holiday recipes that feature foods directly from the nature uh, – from the nature, <laughs> <laughs> from nature, game, fowl, fish, and plant-based recipes are being sought. The DNR already maintains the online cookbook, Wild Maryland, and now they're putting out the call to hunters, anglers, and foragers for holiday recipes. One or more of the popular items in the current recipe collection is burrito pie, uh, said McGinn Meals. It takes on Frito pie, 
and McGinn Meal said it's wildly popular. Many of the dishes might not initially appeal to those who aren't used to eating wild meat, said McGinn Meals. Said two issues come up a lot. A lot of game meats have a bad reputation for being gamey or having a distinctly strong flavor that can be off-putting to people used to buying farm-raised meats. Preparation is another issue, McGinn Meal said. Tenderizing venison with a cooking mallet is recommended. She hasn't prepared venison in her own kitchen, but after sampling one hunter's venison uh, made using Sika deer meat, she found it was quite honestly one of the most tender, most flavorful pieces of meat I have ever had. A lot of what people consider good eating is cultural as well, said McGinn Meals. She pointed out that catfish is, is often dismissed as unappetizing because it's a bottom feeder, but lobsters – and Maryland's iconic blue, cl- blue crabs are also bottom feeders and said there are wonderful joys and flavors to come from bottom feeding fish and shellfish. Catfish, said McGinn Meals, is a mild tasting white fish and a good way to introduce children to fish in their diet. She added that it's a lean protein found everywhere and it's free minus bait and the time you're spending out there catching them. Wild waterfowl such as geese ducks are red meat birds, she said, meaning they have darker, richer meat. Then the poultry people are often accustomed to eating. They are delicious when prepared slow and low, preferably roasted in an oven and finished on the stovetop. At relatively low temperatures and like other red meats, including beef, they are best when served with red wines. Plant-based foraged foods are also going to be included in this holiday collection. Past recipes have included ramps, those garlicky, garlicky flavored members of the allium family related to spring onions and leeks and most often found in the spring. Other popular plants include wild mushrooms like chicken of the woods, chanterelles, lion's mane, and morels. Dandelion greens have also been included in the cookbook. They're high in iron and calcium and have a peppery flavor. So while you're preparing your Thanksgiving meals and have some family favorites or your own recipe collection, Maryland's DNR wants to hear from you. Recipes are being collected now through December 31st. You can submit your recipe uh, for the holiday collection via email. And see the re- recipes already included in the Wild Maryland collection. So I just thought that was um, a neat way to compile that, that they already have a recipe book yeah. that you can go on and, and find. When we put the links in uh, on the website for this, this this article has the links in it uh, to find the current recipe and how you can submit. So I just thought it was great that they were including native plants Um and a way to cook with it. If you're in that area and you have recipes and you're passionate about that, submit them. Yeah, that this article is right on my alley. Yeah, I thought um, you would like this. This one. is my kind of thing because so if uh, if you hunt and fish, um, especially if you, you deer hunt, even if you don't, yeah, I guarantee you someone has told you their secret to cooking venison the best way ever, and it, it probably involves Italian dressing. <laughs> and, and I'm telling you, if you, someone tells you that, they have not had, like, really, really well-cooked yeah. It can come out really good that way, but it's yeah. not like it's – it's you're covering up a lot of the flavor. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's some really cool ways to do it. I love cooking, uh, like, Canada geese and snow geese, yeah. and ducks are awesome. They're, like – it's a little different than what you get at the grocery store. Yeah. But once you learn how to cook with this stuff, it's really fantastic. And then to combine it with a lot of – native plant ingredients and wild mushroom ingredients it's it's just a lot of fun it's um yeah and i love that it's being done by the department of natural resources yeah. too that they're involved in and getting everyone involved and getting you know it's spreading the right message and getting people to think that way yeah um not just hey go to the store and do this like hey you can find a lot of these things they're natural you can find them in the woods by your house things like that and you can cook with it so yeah. it is really you, you have to you have to know your plants if you're going to forage it. That's one thing that we talked about on foraging. Mm-hmm. Just make sure you do your research. You don't have to know, as that Samuel Thayer said, you don't have to know every plant. You just have to know the one that you're trying to har- or forage for. Yep, yep. So, yeah, there's even a, a guy I follow on Instagram called um, – his name's Larry White, but he has a, a Instagram page, page. I think it's called Wild Game Gourmet, and he has just like all these wild game recipes. He'll incorporate some different um, – uh, like wild sourced ingredients too. Yeah. There's uh the forager chef who I've mentioned before does a lot of this kind of stuff as well. But it's like it's so much beyond just the regular meat and potatoes. I'm just on his on his Instagram right now. He's like venison shank shawarma and like wild board pancetta. Um, like there's all kinds of stuff that's just awesome. Yeah, uh, that's it's higher level cooking using wild game ingredients. 
stuff. If you went to like a five star restaurant, you're just using things that you went out and hunted or yeah. foraged and all that kind of stuff. It's it's a lot of fun if you're into cooking yeah. and and into that kind of stuff. So yeah, and that article is right up my alley. Yeah, so check so. it out. I think you'll like some of those recipes. Yeah, definitely. definitely. Now I'm looking for. I might this. even submit some of my own. Oh, I would the, like that. You know, I would like that. I yeah. I'm seeing your article. I'm familiar with this one, so well, I'm kind of, of course excited. You're familiar for... with it because my dad <laughs> sent it to both of us, Frank. <laughs> and I was a little worried you were going to pick this one too. No, no, no. And uh, I was glad to see you didn't. And I really love your article. Um, but this was a cool article as well, and I was glad my dad forwarded it to me. Yes. And uh, it's titled, Farmer's Battle Against and Now For Milkweed. And uh, it was written on, or released on August 8th of 2022, written by Jennifer Taylor and for Modern Farmer Magazine and website, and um, which is a really cool magazine for agriculture. Yeah. And uh, covers a lot of, like, diverse topics. It's more modern topics. I guess yes. that's why it's called Modern yeah. Farmer. Yeah. I'll read a little bit, then I'll give some of my thoughts. Um, it starts with, from behind the driving wheel of his pickup truck, Don uh, Ginnup returned the ear ignition key, flipped on the AC, and immediately rolled down the windows. The sticky midsummer air barely budged, even as cool air from the dashboard vents mixed with the breeze flooding the cab. A few miles down the narrow road from his Marshall, Illinois family farm, found in 1837, he stopped and pointed. There at the base of the utility pole, under a tethered wire, was a clump of thriving common milkweed reaching three or four feet toward a partly cloudy sky. It's protected there, the 70-year-old farmer says. By now, the milkweed has matured. Under the power lines, milkweed has been left untouched by the farmer's last mowing pass. The stems are sturdy and deep. Green leaves arranged in opposite pairs are broad and thick. At the top, a cluster of small uh, pink flowers uh, form a sphere, a beacon for monarch butterflies along a crucial yet disappearing migration path. Scenes like this, clumps of milkweed dotting grasslands that encase crops, are now the norm. But up until the mid-1940s, before herbicides were introduced to commercial agriculture, milkweed grew relentlessly in croplands. It was invasive. It impacted crop yields to the point where farmers like Ginnup recall the labor-intensive chore of pulling milkweed from their fields as, chil- as children. Um, just a couple thoughts before I keep yeah. going. But that was, yeah, that was a big thing. Is like milkweed was, if you were a farmer, milkweed, along with other things yes. like ragweed and, and some other stuff Mare's as well. Mare's tail. Mare's tail. That was like cutting into your livelihood yeah. um it was a big big deal we didn't understand as a population the importance of it at that point yes. other than that it was hurting us economically big time and you're think about it you're going through the great depression prior yeah. to the great depression that kind of stuff like you're already living a rural meager lifestyle lifestyle that yield um, was important like you yeah. that was if you didn't have enough you were saying how am i going to feed my family through yes. the winter Um, it's, uh, so yeah, milkweed has a, had a really bad reputation and you have a large population of the agriculture community, the agriculture as a whole. If you look at like the average age of farmers, basically the average age of a farmer goes up one year every year because there aren't many new farmers coming in. (laughs) So I think it was like 58 a couple years ago. Now it's probably 59 or 60. Wow. Um, Yeah, it it just, it keeps going up because you don't have younger people stepping into those roles. But not, well, if you're, that this farmer in this article is 70 years old, and he remembers pulling milk, milkweed as a kid. And a lot of farmers in this area I know are in that eight, same age range, and they don't like milkweed, and their par- or their parents didn't like milkweed. And there's less farmland. I, I just heard at the uh, the state soil conservation district meeting. I don't remember the time frame, but there used to be – I can't remember how many years ago there was 2 million acres of farmland in New Jersey. Now it's 750,000, mm-hmm. so yeah. it's less than half of what it was. And oh, I can't yeah. remember. It was like 20 years or something like that. It wasn't. Yeah, so you have generation upon generation who did not like milkweed, yeah. and only recently we found out the importance of it. So um, the common milkweed is the main plant species that monarch butterfly needs to survive, and the species is disappearing at a rapid rate. If milkweed cease to exist, scientists say, uh, so too will the iconic monarch butterfly. The perilous state of milkweed matters to farmers like Ginnup because he says, we don't want to burden the environment when we don't need to. As it turns out, the decline of milkweed threatens more than monarchs. Such threats have a cascading effect that eventually affect humans as one-third of the nation's food production is dependent on pollinators like the monarch. The threats to monarchs are plenty. Logging in its overwintering habitat, uh, lost nectar sources, exposure to insecticides, climate change, and loss of breeding habitat are all factors in its decline. Increasingly, evidence shows a major comp- contributor to the recent decline of monarchs um, is the loss of common milkweed, which is Asclepia syriaca, as a breeding habitat in the Midwest, specifically the Midwest. Like, we're in New Jersey. 
the main monarch migration is really going up yeah. right up the center of the country. Uh, we still have plenty of monarchs that come through here, but I can only imagine how many more are going through that there. area. So loss of habitat there is or is really it's huge everywhere, but there specific a big big yeah. thing. Um, let's see where was I. Uh, researchers discovered that milkweed growing in corn and soybean fields supported more monarch eggs and larvae than those growing in other areas. To respond to the loss, scientists and conservationists are re- researching how to rebuild milkweed populations with calls to restore 1.3 billion to 1.6 billion, that's billion with a B, uh, milkweed stems in the Midwest alone. Uh, in 2015, uh, BASF, which is a German chemical company, promoted a program that provided more than 35,000 milkweed stems to farmers in an effort to establish more milkweed on grasslands. Uh, farmers signed up for it. The very weed they fought for decades, they were now planting. Milkweed was planted in filter strips, the land next to drainage dishes, bordering crops, and even planted as landscaping in yards. The conditions for milkweed aren't hard to achieve. The plants thrive in poor soil and, uh, and full sun, uh, like dry conditions. Uh, scientists continue seeking other solutions uh, to help with this milkweed problem. One Michigan State University study recently showed targeting mo- targeted mowing of milkweed in grasslands during specific times of the growing season produces more milkweed stems that are attractive to egg-laying monarchs and harbor fewer predators, but mowing alone won't cut it for the monarch. Guinness believes farmers with strong, cons- uh, with strong conservation ethics will be compelled to take action on their grassy spaces. Without conservation, agriculture ceases to function and ceases to exist. While it hasn't always been immediately obvi- obvious that biodiversity bolsters agriculture, it clearly does. Without milkweed and without other wild plants, the landscape loses not only the monarch but other linkages to the system. Ultimately, Ginnett believes there needs to be more common ground to reach a balance between human beings and Mother Nature. And deep down this, farmers are the first environmentalists. It's a great turnaround. Yeah. And and that's why I champion people like Debbie Deglava uh, and yeah. Sustainable oh, yeah. Monarch. Because they're to, trying to, to turn agriculture and milkweed and actually make them the same. Yeah. It, it's really amazing. Saying that you can be profitable and make a business off of helping mm-hmm. the environment, which – is a message I think not yeah. many believe, but she's the right person to spread that message. Yep. And, and first thing I'll say, there, there's a lot more of this article that I pulled out. I just kind of hit on some of the the big points yes. that I want to make. I took a lot of the quotes out, and uh, there's a whole section of a, a, another farmer they're talking about that. I'm just like, oh, I, if I start quoting so many people, I'm going to really confuse myself. <laughs> um, so I <laughs> encourage you all to read this article as well. But there's a uh, actually, so you're, have all this milkweed pulling that's going on uh, pre-1940, and then you have World War II. And this was still milkweed pulling, but there was something really interesting that happened in World War II. Well, two really interesting things, one positive and one negative, but they were encouraging um, rural kids to actually pick milkweed pods as they pulled milkweed because the floss was used in World War II-era uh, life preservers. Yes. And it helped, it was like floss to help uh, troops float or something yeah. like that was the campaign. Yeah. And they actually have some of the imagery of old posters in this article yeah. too. So it's it's important how, or it's it's cool to see how the government actually put some messaging yeah. into this as well and how you were being patriotic um, by, and helping the country by taking the milkweed product and repurposing it uh, or sending it in so it could be repurposed. Yeah. Um, but I guess, yeah, what I was getting at a little bit earlier is you have farmers today are just statistically older than they've ever yes. been. Uh, most of them grew up thinking either directly they learned milkweed was bad or their parents were saying, hey, milkweed is cutting into our profits. Um, I've heard farmers locally say that. Oh, yeah. Like it's not yeah. like that's a thought. Oh, yeah. This is, yeah. this is like a very common thing. Farmers do not like milkweed. But they're starting to learn, and even we have um, one of our coworkers, <laughs> husband is a farmer, and uh, even so, her father in law is like, "Oh yeah, I, I'd like to do some more stuff with native plants." I think now that it's a it's a tough thing because you have people. It's we've talked about before. You get so ingrained in your mind that this thing is bad, and then to find out it's important. It's it's not everyone's gonna well, not everyone's gonna hear that information. Yeah. Two, if you hear it, you're not always gonna believe that information. And then three, it's like, it's, I'm trying to think of a good analogy, but it's like finding out this thing that you thought was so bad all your life is actually good, or the thing that was so good is actually hurting you. In this case, it's helping you, but 
it's like a complete flip on what you've been accustomed to. It's not an easy transition for people. No, and it, but generationally, it can be. The unfortunate thing is we don't have that next generation yeah. of farmers that's really coming up to that. The ones that are there do think this yeah. way, yeah, and say, "Oh yeah, milkweed's actually good. And we should be yeah. incorporating this into our farms in a way." Now, our coworker's father-in-law oh. that's saying this is probably just below the average. Uh, um, yeah, I'd say he's probably 55. I was going to say he's not that much older than me. Yeah. yeah I was going to say 56. I don't even, he might not even be older than you. Yeah. He's, yeah, I'm not, I'm not he quite sure. He might even be my age. But yeah, even but, I'm, I'm involved with Farm Bureau Young Farmers, um, which is a national program. I'm involved locally and we talk about it and people are like, yeah, I don't, I don't want to be an environmental harm. I want to make sure I'm, uh, I have a profitable business, yeah. but if I can avoid, if I can make the same amount of money, even slightly less. Yeah. But know that I'm not hurting the environment by doing it. Like I can make a choice that's yeah. going to have less impact on the environment. I'm going to make the yeah. choice that has less impact. And now I, you're saying I'm going to not make any money, or I'm going to make yeah. a lot of money. Oh, I I need to feed my family. I need to. Yeah, I was going to say it's not like a lifestyle. It's even over time. It's not like yeah. farmers are killing it. Yeah, they're not killing it. Yeah. Their their biggest crop is their real estate. Yeah. you know that where they can afford to make money. Yeah. so they're not killing it. So the fact that they're willing to maybe take a little bit less. Yeah. To help the environment and not be a hindrance, and a lot of it, like you talk to farmers, Ray Archuleta said it. They, they, the soil is their livelihood. So they, when that last quote, farmers are the first environmentalists. Yeah. If they don't have the ground that that they're working, they don't have they don't have anything. they don't have a job. Yeah, like that. So keeping that as healthy as possible is really important to them, um, and pollinator habitat is really important to them. It's just you also have a lot of money telling you, oh, well, you can do it another way. Yeah. So it's, um, yeah, but you have some like BASF has done stuff, Bayer has done stuff, but it's, is it publicity is it or is it or, enough? Yeah, is, is it, it just like, hey, yeah. this is, hey, we're going to do this a little bit so it makes us look good or I don't know. I, I'm not, I'm not going to be the, the judge on that one, but no. it's, no. um, but it's, it's, gr- it's better than not doing anything. It's it's a start. You know, yeah. I was really thinking about it, especially after our episode with, with Peter Grothman. Like, there's a lot – we we don't have the answers. Like, mm-hmm. time, and, time in and time again you hear this stuff, and it's great to see little steps being made. We don't have the answers. What I like is that people are asking the right yeah. questions. Oh, it's yeah. becoming a topic of conversation, and if that happens, then change can be made. And that's aware. Awareness is the best thing. I think. I think that's our biggest mm-hmm. trait is awareness. You know, is that we help it. We help have these conversations in a way mm-hmm. that people understand. It may. I, I was actually talking to Saul the other day, yeah. and I know we don't have any listener questions. And I was just calling to check in on him. And he actually had a really bad car accident about a month ago, and totaled this car and walked away. Scratch free, mm-hmm. which only I think he could do. Yeah, <laughs> with uh, no airbags deploying. Actually, not one. The Every ski airbag mask acts as a, yes, an airbag. Yeah, is... Every airbag failed, and he walked away without a scratch, which is kind of crazy. But he was saying one of the things that he appreciates about the podcast is that even though there's a lot of horrible things and it may not give you an answer, we always end with a ray of hope. Mm-hmm. And this article to me gives a ray of hope. Yeah. Oh yeah, you know, and that's that's all you can ask for. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's you. You need that. You want to be able to take the next step on the journey. That Definitely. helps you. It makes you makes you feel better about that next step. But I think two great articles, uh, both kind of dealing with food in a way. You know, mm-hmm. you have one about uh, an awareness of native foods and recipes through the DNR. You have one about farmers becoming aware of the environment and and wanting to help with monarchs and milkweed. So two great articles. Uh, we'll have this posted same day. Mm-hmm. Like we've been pretty good, oh, yeah. so make sure you get on and vote. Not for both articles. Yeah, there, that, can, there can be that only is one the loophole that will no longer be open. <laughs> but, uh, but, I will make sure that. <laughs> but make sure you vote because. And of course, the choice is yours. Okay, before we do listener shout outs, did you remember to try Magic Mind? I did, yeah, yeah. Right. And it was pretty good. I, I actually really liked it. It's a little yeah. herbaceous tasting, but it's uh, a little citrusy. It, yeah. It's I, nice. I was hesitant, and like I took a little sip the first time. Like, I know, like, I was like, maybe this is going to taste bad. I'll do a shot. But I actually, like, really took my time drinking it. Like, yeah. I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, but 
like you, yeah. uh, I can kind of feel groggy in the morning sometimes. So I just wanted to, like, I, maybe this could help. Uh, I'm not a coffee drinker. I've made that abundantly yeah, clear. Totally. That I don't like drinking coffee. I don't always react well to caffeine, I think. But, um, no, this I was I felt fine. I felt, like, basically right after taking it, I was kind of upbeat, in a good mood, getting things done. I felt really productive yeah, after drinking it. And it makes me feel good that it's natural ingredients too. I, I'm trying to put better things in my body. So when you could put turmeric, echinacea, matcha, mushrooms, honey, things like that, I just feel much better than all that caffeine. And another really cool thing I appreciated about Magic Mind was that they were – doing a lot of things for the environment as well. Like they're trying to be a carbon neutral company. Uh, they're invested in some reforestation products. Even the places where they're getting the ingredients for their product, they're selecting vendors who are doing things the right way. Kind of like what we like to do with yeah. with people we work with. And they spread the knowledge. They wrote the book on Beyond Coffee. That was before the product even came out explaining kind of what coffee does and, and some better alternatives for you. So I appreciate their entire mission. Yeah. No, I, I, I really enjoyed it. It's something I think when I need that pick me up when I'm like, hey, I need to have a productive day. I didn't get the best night's sleep. I think it's something I'm going to try and, uh, and just to get a little pick me up. I think our listeners should try it too. If you go to magicmind.co backslash native plants, uh, you can get 40% off a subscription, which is – it's a money-back guarantee. It's To me, it's better than going to the store. Just use the code NATIVEPLANTS20. You can also use that code NATIVEPLANTS20 to get 20% off a single purchase. Yeah, We'll put all of it in the show notes. Give it a try. I think you'll appreciate it. Tom and I both do. So let's get back into listener shout-outs. Listener, listener, shout-out, shout-out. So, Fran, I, I can't help but – mention yes before we go into our listener shout outs this yeah. week is didn't we have a listener shout out like a couple weeks ago to say how happy they were that we didn't get political and then i <laughs> <laughs> i just made a whole bunch of political jokes earlier it's just like episode. oh you take my I, mind I, off the politics i got I close to... <laughs> but i i'm saying it in jest and uh I'm, oh we, and very cynically <laughs> this is <laughs> the way to put it this is so far yeah. away from being political yeah. um so i know you have one i have a few more than your you this week do you want me to go First, uh, oh, I don't really care. Okay, who wants right. to go first? I'll it's... go first. So, um, I wanted to say thank you to Bill Stusnick for the vote to to help get me over the hump last week. I appreciate that you voted for me. Um, and you mentioned this on the last podcast, but I did. I didn't want to to gloss over it. We both wanted to thank Skip Burns, mm -hmm. um, yeah, again for. Uh, referring Dr. Peter Groffman mm -hmm. to us. Uh, he was yeah. – that I was, was really my, one of my favorite episodes. My final thought, I was like, man, how did we not know who this person is until now? Yeah. Right in our backyard. Yeah. Um, and and that, Well, that will change. I think, yeah, that's um, – That has changed. Something like it was, as we're planning some upcoming events over the next 2023, 2024, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'm in charge of putting together a whole slate of, of speakers for something, I'm like, oh, well – Add him to the list of people I'm going to ask yeah. to come down and, and give a talk. So. so, Skip, thank you so much for, for that recommendation and for submitting questions for it. We, we really appreciate that. Um, you do have an opportunity to submit questions mm -hmm. for this episode. You, you have like a good five days. Yeah. So if you have questions, I'm going to give you the question and comment line because we'd like to play it for Dr. Groffman on the air. Mm -hmm. 215 Three four six six one eight nine. Um, if we're the planning, the episode is is going to kind of continue where it left off. We want to talk about leaf cover, snow cover, how the climate's changed, and then bring it back around and say what are the solutions, what is advice, how can we talk to people, how can uh, we make a difference. So that's if you have questions in those topics, please, we would be happy to do that, um, and then. Uh, my last thank you is to Amanda Smith who tweeted at us uh, yesterday because the Spotify wraps are out, mm -hmm. and she, we were her top podcast, and she said she listened to us for 3,233 minutes. That is a long, long time. I was I, I had to say I, I don't even believe that my family listened to 3,233 minutes I, of me. See, I had my Spotify wrapped, and I think I only had um, like 8,500 minutes total. Wow. And I well, I that being said, I haven't listened to Spotify as much. I don't use 
I use Apple Podcasts to listen to podcasts when mm-hmm. I'm feeling self indulgent yes. and want to listen to my buttery voice uh, <laughs> at home. <laughs> but um, no, I will. No, I actually I don't listen to us very much. I will but. say this for our listeners: fifty percent of our listens come from Apple. Only about eight percent of our listens come from Spotify. But the Spotify rap that we got for a podcast was yeah. very flattering. Oh, yeah. And we can't thank you all enough for that. And then I think the last two categories are I, I think we're like three and a half percent pod bean and three and a half percent what is it, overcast or something like yep. that. Yep. Not even Google. So yeah. I think Google's less than that. But, so and just to, to follow up on that statistic, so thirty three thousand two hundred and thirty three minutes yes. is basically the equivalent of a little over fifty three hours, which uh, would that's approximately like be like forty three episodes. If yeah. you're an hour and fifteen minutes an episode, about forty three episodes. Wow, that's so, impressive. Yeah, so thank you, you. Didn't listen to every single one. <laughs> what were you doing? It's you're you're nine episodes short. <laughs> so yeah, if it, you know how they give like perfect perfect attendance in yes, school. That it's wasn't like, perfect well, attendance. No, no sticker for you, uh, Amanda Smith. <laughs> but, but we appreciate you listening. No, Hopefully we really you'll do. hear that. I hope this isn't one of the episodes you skip listening yeah. to. <laughs> yeah, no, we we really appreciate. And if if anyone else has their Spotify wrapped and they want to share it with us, you can Please do it do. on Facebook. You can do it on on uh, on Twitter. Um, totally. I was going to make another political joke, but I'm not going <laughs> no, to. No, I'm not going to no, touch no, it. No, no, no. <laughs> But you have you have we we got a yeah. five star review where someone actually did. reached out to us, and I love I love the name because it reminds me of like the the AOL instant messenger screen yes. names, yes, the it AIM does. screen names. Uh, like I'm thinking of like what's the Avril Lavigne song was Skater Girl, right? Yes. And it was had the eight Skater in there. Boy, yeah, or Skater Skater Boy, yeah. yeah. But yeah, this is is Nature Girl with N eight R G R L. Love it, love it, gotta love it. Um, and this was put right before Thanksgiving, and said that they were thankful for Tom and Fran, uh, yeah. Yeah. which I can only assume is either you or my wife. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I'm, well, we, we tried to make it a competition. Yeah. We said at the Thanksgiving dinner, pull out your your relative's phone and vote for one of us. Like just in the yeah. review, say either Tom or Fran and make it a competition. Yeah. She refused to make it a competition yeah. and vote for both of us. Well, that, so. and we really appreciate that as well. Yeah. And if you want to be my listener shout out, you can leave a five-star review. Yes. Write a little something there and I'll, I'll say something flattering about you um, during this section of the podcast. Yeah, I like so. it. I like it. So um, we don't have any uh, questions called in this week. Uh, we already kind of did a grow read a book. Mm-hmm. Um, you want to do take it or leave it? Yeah, and I did you look at what I put? I, I did look at what you put. And I'm <laughs> like, I don't, I don't so know where you're going with this. I thing. just learned, and I didn't know this was a thing, mm-hmm. um, that the president pardons the Thanksgiving Day turkey every year. Yeah, but it only started with George Bush Senior. Mm-hmm. Um. So it hasn't been that long standing of a tradition. But yet I tried to look and the president I still think pretty much has a turkey dinner on that. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what do you think and the turkey provided is provided to the White House from the president of the National Turkey Federation, typically mm-hmm. from uh one of their their farms yeah. or something. Which like is that. different than the folks that we've had on from yes. the National Wild, Wild turkey, turkey Federation. Yeah. Not the same thing. Um Yes. Easily confused. Both yes. have turkey. No, three words yeah. are the exact same. Yes. Uh, <laughs> there's an extra extra W in the acronym for but the what wild turkey. What do you think of, of pardoning the turkey for publicity, but yet everyone having a Thanksgiving yeah. day? I know it's not really has to do with native plants, <laughs> but it has to do with a wild, a native, a native animal. And, yeah. Okay. And um, I was running short on take it or leave it. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I was so I do have a take of the leaf for, for next time. All right, perfect. That I'm going to say now, and All let right. everyone think about. It. They can stew, and you can stew, Fran. But okay. I think our next one has to be real or fake Christmas trees, and then Ooh, we can tie native right. Christmas trees into there as well. All right, um, I'm I'm writing that down. That, right now. that could that can be a juicy subject. But going back to turkeys, Ooh. you know what? Wow. All right, that's a great one. That's a great um, one, and it will be perfect timing. Yeah. Um, going back to turkeys. I, so I didn't know that the turkey. It makes sense. The turkey was d- donated by the president of the National Turkey Foundation, which is a turkey producers yes, organization. Yes. 
And before, I always thought it, I knew about this for a while, and I'm like, oh, it's kind of funny. It's kind of yeah. the president gets up there and talks about stuffing and like makes all yeah. these. He's yes. he's a father, yeah. not faux yeah. pas. It's <laughs> genuine dad jokes um, using stuffing and sauce and yeah. and gobble and like all kinds yeah. of Thanksgiving type terms. Yes. Um, and I'm like, yeah, it's it's kind of funny. Like the president can pardon people, and it's yeah. not doing it for like political misdoings and all yes. this stuff. Yes. So it's, yeah, it's, it's humorous knowing that this is something like it, a legal thing that presidents can do and you can do it for turkeys yeah. because everyone's going to eat a turkey and that means the turkey had to die. Yeah. Is um, there a better message than pardoning the turkey? Instead of making yeah. it something lighthearted for a holiday, is there a better message that could be? I don't know. but that, So I guess where I was getting with it is now I know that it's it's provided by the National Turkey, is it Fountain Foundation or Federation, mm-hmm. whatever it is, Um I'm like, is this just a, a big publicity, like publicity stunt? <laughs> it's like to, I, to, it, it might just be. I don't know. So, yeah, the conspiracy theorist in me is like, oh, big turkeys behind this. Yeah. And, uh, so, um, which, yeah, it's a. Uh, I, I don't. I don't, this one. Do you really don't care? Flabbergasted. And I really don't know. Like, I it's a funny the turkeys this year. Am I being chocolate too... and chip? <laughs> It's, it's, and they got they waddled on up to the stage and and he pardoned them and then uh, they probably went back to the turkey farm. Who knows if they actually made it or not? I um, wonder if they actually get part, like if yeah. they are left to live. Yeah. Well, where else are they going to go? Yeah. Like other than back to the turkey farm, farm and then back. they have a bunch of white turkeys in there. You know, the little side here, you know why? So wild turkeys are are basically black. Yeah. They're kind of yeah. black iridescent. They have different colors on them but primarily yes. they're blackish brown gray yes they've selected um through breeding you can breed turkey like and they've gotten white turkeys now okay. do you know why the turkeys are white i have no chickens idea. too chicken yeah. white chickens are yeah. white so there's multiple kinds of feathers on birds yeah. and some of the things are called like pin feathers so they're really really small and then they're just but on a wild turkey or a duck or a yeah. chick like a regular not a white chicken they're black. Okay. So now you have a bird, and when it's all plucked, it has all these little black dots everywhere. Oh, really hard to get out. Yeah. What you end up doing is taking, like, a torch, or you put it over a, a burner and okay. burn them off yeah. um, to kind of – you can't hold it too long. You just kind of, like, yeah. just to burn those little <laughs> things off so you don't yeah. see them anymore. But they still kind of show the, like, little black dots everywhere. Yeah. If you have a white feathered turkey, you don't see it as the much. white dot. So ah. you don't – it kind of blends in, and um, you don't wow. see all the little – the pin feathers. Wow. So, yeah. That's all that for that, just to make it yeah. more yeah. more better visibly mm-hmm. aesthetics. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah, that's I that's what I've been told is the main reason okay. behind why they're they yeah. bred them to be white. But yeah, I know yeah. I've been to I've been to a local turkey farm and it's I guess it's like it's it's not the most appealing thing, yeah, to I look at, know. and that's just like a small a small one where they have a barn with some turkeys, Re- really cool farm, yeah. And I'm like, ah, eh, I don't know if I necessarily wanted to see this as yeah. Fuck. I understand the whole process, yeah. but it's like you kind of you feel a little bad, yeah. and then you think about th- you have the big turkey producers where you have like warehouses full of birds like this, and it's like uh, I don't know how I feel about it. I'm, yeah, I'm but I'm then again I'm like the person who's all well, i was going crazy yeah. about the wild game cooking earlier um but part of the reason is i'd like to source my food yeah myself which is a different that's a whole different yeah thing another thing i that drives me nuts when people people get into hunting and they're like oh and you always see the posts like this time of year because it's deer season now and people are like oh yeah I, like i got this deer i'm gonna eat it look at all this organic meat <laughs> i'm like it ain't organic. <laughs> it's been eating all this GMO corn. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think it's been eating? It's not organic. It's um, but yeah, there's, it's just amazing. It's it's humorous to me how we can like just because it's wild, people assume it's organic. It's eating people's people's uh, landscapes. Like <laughs> it's all, it could like, be it's all this like hybrid stuff, and yeah, it's like it's eating all. What do you mean it's organic? It's like it's not eating. It's literally it's it's going to starve in for a couple months now. Yeah. Um, it's uh, it, but it is really nutritious and healthy. 
it's very lean protein. Yeah. But yeah, I always I always get a chuckle when people post the organic stuff because I'm like, uh, not really. It's, yeah, but it's people yeah. convolute those terms together, yes. and and it's just it's important to be educated on kind of what those terms mean and really some of the marketing tools that go into some of this stuff. Yeah. Um, you look into like the chicken industry and it's like, what, what does free range actually mean? What is like cage free actually mean? Yeah. Cage free could mean they're just let loose in a warehouse. There's no cages. Yeah. They're just walking around. It doesn't mean they're, yeah. they're actually outside and pe- people get the idea. Oh, they're walking around on this farm and living this nice farm life yeah. until the farmer comes along and yeah, <laughs> There goes Mr. Clucky or Mrs. Clucky, probably. And uh, <laughs> I think I'm kind of on one today. It's the Magic Mind. I've been drinking the Magic Mind, and it's really it's really perked me up. You know what? <laughs> I'm, and yeah, that's it's it's good stuff. Yeah, it really. Is. Yeah. I think because uh, we're doing this at the very end of the day, and you can see how much silly energy yeah. we have I'm right going, now. That's not tired yeah. energy. I'm going on vacation energy. in a couple hours. Yeah, yeah, there you go. All right, so are we both taking it. We're both. Take it means that I I like it. Yes. Or you leave it. Oh my gosh. I. I'm probably gonna take it. I I think it's I I think it's humorous. I I, and like I'm I'm not behind. I'm not behind like the factory farming, for lack of a better term, of of turkeys and chickens and all that. So that kind of puts like a a damper on on it for me yeah knowing that it's tied into that but it makes sense but i'm also i support agriculture and that is a form of agriculture i yeah. think i support agriculture my my ambition behind a lot of it is hey let's let's blend these these worlds yes. where we're being more environmentally conscious like we're not going to get rid of agriculture and have society no. anymore no it's, but if we can make work, positive changes let's, yeah let's make sure we're more on the same page and not against each other, which has kind of been what's happening lately. Exactly. All right. We're, we're both taking it then. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Awesome. All right. I think that wraps us up. Yeah. That's going to, that's going to uh, finish us for today. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed listening to the buzz. Thank you everyone for listening to native plants, healthy planet presented by Pylons nursery. We're saying thank you to RJ Comer for our buzz theme music, which is entitled nightly suicide. Make sure you stream or buy RJ's music on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you consume your music. Better yet, check out one of his Americana playlists on Pandora. You won't uh, regret it. Follow us on Twitter at Pineland nursery, Facebook at Pinelands nursery, NJ Instagram at Pinelands nursery, and also YouTube at Pinelands nursery. Uh, give us a call on the question and comment line at 215-346-6189. I will repeat that, 215-346-6189. If you have a question for uh, Dr. Grothman next week, leave that. Or if you have a question or comment for us, leave that, and we're going to play it on a future episode of The Buzz. Answer it to the best of our ability. And, uh, man, the spam the spam threats on uh, the Native Plant Healthy Planet Facebook uh, group are real. If you knew how many – uh, magic gardening tool or pruner ads I have to <laughs> I have to delete every day that just oh, means God. that group is 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 uh is it's lively yeah, yeah people yeah. are trying people are trying to get in yes exactly yeah so um, you can buy native plants healthy planet merch at our website www.nativeplantshealthyplanet.com there's a little bar at the top it says t-shirts here buy now something like that there's a lot of great new yeah i've actually made a few purchases myself yeah so i have finally followed up on my promise the dragons are here <laughs> they are everything you hope they would be so, no honestly it's been it's there's some great you new get concepts in your head on yeah. what to do there's one friend and i were literally just talking about that i think i will um, buy as soon as you post that i will not buy to that. get political yeah <laughs> but yeah. But one of the things my brother and I were just talking about is um, it you have these demographics in our country right now where you have people like it's in a way it seems like patriotism is at on on all time low. I tend to be a patriotic person, and the people who are are kind of down on the direction of our country also really care about the environment yeah. over overall demographically yeah. speaking yeah. overall they kind of lean that way the people who um kind of seem like disengaged when it comes to like anti-environment in a way yeah. tend to be a little bit more patriotic 
And he's like, I would love to have a shirt that says plant American plants with red, white, and blue with the flag on <laughs> with the flag on it. Maybe put like an oak leaf on there or something like that. And he, he said that, and I'm like, I can make that in about five minutes, yeah. and I think that's a great idea. So we have a shirt that says plant American plants. Fran and I are both like pumped yeah. up to wear this at our, our nursery trade shows yeah. and walk around all the Japanese barberry and and, uh, and all the other it, non-native plants, stuff it, from other places in, in the world. It and made me think of John McGee. With it did, his yeah. story about yeah. I want to plant plants that come from America, like yeah. not plants that come from other parts of the world. Yeah. So, and I would love. I'm trying to brainstorm because some. So, some of the shirts on there uh, just give the whole disclosure. So, we all the sales get lumped into one pool. So, yeah. all the profits get lumped into one pool. But then we have some shirts, like we have a, a shirt that lists some of the top trees for Doctor yeah. Tommy. At the end of the year, that goes whatever down. money we made off of those shirts goes to his research. There's a Xerxes we have some line, that yeah. go like buzzing about native plants goes to Xerxes. We have some that go to wildlife organizations, specific, like wild the wild about native plants shirt. Every dollar that's made off of that or profited off of them goes to wildlife specific yeah. organizations. Um, there's I think there's one for New Jersey Audubon on there. Um, I have one that's been sitting in my drafts, and I need to find the original artwork because it wasn't working when I was trying to submit okay. it the other day. That and I want to do this for every state or well. I guess shouldn't do it for every state because that's just way too many T-shirts. But the top states, we got to figure out. People write in if you want one of these for your state. You know, like the I Love New York shirts? Yeah. That they have like the, well, it has I Love New York on it. And with a heart, instead of a heart, it says, it has a picture of your state. And then it says I state native plant, or I love yeah. native plants, but it's your yeah. state. So it's like a picture of New uh, Jersey uh, there. And I was going to, that one is set up. To go to the Native Plant Society, to support the Native Plant Society. Oh, that's an but awesome idea. If you live in Pennsylvania or New York or California and you would like a shirt like that with your state on it, I'll, I'll do that for people. Okay. Um, I just awesome. to do all 50 states and then you start talking territories and, and all that. Um, I don't know if we'll sell like an I Love or I Hawaii Native yeah. Plant shirt or anything like that, but I'm, the New Jersey one's going to be out soon once I find the artwork. So, yeah, two, there's some cool stuff up so there. Two things. It, because I just realized – because I hadn't been on it in a while, the website. When you go to the website, it takes you to the featured. That's not everything. It's just featured. So make sure you click on the tabs at the top. Mm-hmm. That's our site. That's our yeah, product's yeah. website. So mm-hmm. it's not going to take you away. It's going to bring you to other products. Because yep. yep. there's blankets. There's water bottles. Mm-hmm. There's all kinds. There's aprons. Notepads, aprons. Yep. Yeah. There's all kinds of things. So Hoodies, don't, all don't kinds just look at that first page and think that's it. Yep. Um, second thing is you're extending the discount code. Correct or no? We extended the discount code, okay, and it expired today. Okay, never mind. Unless you want to keep, we can keep it going. Keep it going. Week. Keep it All going right, another we'll keep week. Keep it going another week. All right. You know, I'm just thinking to myself. I, I, I said I was extending it. I don't know if I actually did <laughs> extend right. it. So I'm going to do that right do now. Do that right now before it's... it gets too late. So, um, but all, as Tom said, all those profits go to these great organizations. Our last recipient recipient was Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve. We haven't forgotten about you. We're going to come out and visit and bring that to you directly. Um, so make sure that uh, you're ready for us. We may even bring some equipment and try to record record with you while we're there. So um, check us yeah. out. Also, I was going to say, what else did I have to say here, Fran? I got to well, say about yeah, where to listen to you us. You can listen to us also at our website, www.nativeplantshealthyplanet.com. Um, but you're probably going to listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, really where every consumer podcast. Uh, if you have a Spotify rap, send it our way. We want to see it. Um, and if you leave that five-star review, you do a little write-up, you'll get a listener shout-out from me, yours truly, Tom Knezik, and uh, – yeah, that's that's gonna wrap it up I, for me. I don't have a secret, do you? You had a secret last week, but did you share or last? Yeah, buzz? no, we you both ended up did. Sharing it? Hey, all right, here's uh. s- small silly secret. Who yeah. was your top listen to artist on your Spotify wrap up? Uh, so yeah, this is actually a really good one. It was it was Tyler Childers. Okay. Um, what's interesting is so my son is starting to develop t- his own taste in music. Yeah. Uh, his his favorite song. It appears at the moment right now is is uh, Jingle Bells. Does not like the Frank Sinatra version because they don't sing Jingle Bells right away. Y- yes, they sing like the Jingle J. They yeah. spell Jingle yeah. Bells first, and he's like, "This is not Jingle Bells," and <laughs> it's like, "No, it's it's coming." Jingle Bells is, is more towards the middle, and um, 
And we were actually, uh, I had him by myself the other night and had to go pick up some stuff from the grocery store. There's McDonald's across the street and we had an app and it got yeah. for like free Big Mac, whatever. Yeah. So I took him there after I just say like all the stuff about how I'm anti <laughs> it was an easy it was an easy night for me a single dad on That's, night I, I've, I got I make understand. it easy on myself I understand um, but uh, yeah so we went there and Jingle Bells came over their speakers and he's singing along at the top of his lungs in the McDonald's <laughs> and uh, and then the next song comes on and it was one it was another Christmas song yeah. I don't remember and um, and he was upset that it wasn't Jingle Bells so he sang along to Jingle Bells <laughs> anyway and then the next song comes on. He's like, "This is not Jingle Bell." <laughs> but he also loves um, two year old loves Disney Plus. Has like this is uh, not this is Halloween. It's um that's the song, uh, the uh, Nightmare, Nightmare Before, Before Christmas. Christmas yeah. Love that. For, I'm like, I'm scared of this movie, and wow. you like it. What the heck's going on? So he loved that. The music from that. He so those were in the top he loves of your um he loves uh world's smallest violin by AJR. Rip. Which was a uh, TikTok song. Uh, um, that was he would literally say, "Play my song. favorite song," and he, <laughs> he knows how to talk to Alexa now in our house. Okay, so he's and he also thinks that on the i. This is a really long secret. He also thinks that iPhones also have an Alexa and doesn't realize that they're Siri. Oh. so he knows to hold down the yeah, like and to turn the the Siri on, but then he's asking Alexa to play <laughs> songs, <laughs> which. Siri doesn't quite understand what he's trying to do, so it tries to text people on my phone that are named Alex. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if you are in my phone book and have the name Alex, Sorry. including yeah. like uh, people I played lacrosse with 15 years ago, <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. Um, well, that's my son well, saying things. I don't have Spotify, but I use Apple, and the interesting thing is I use my Apple Music for the office here. So mm -hmm. it's hard to say that it's my top artist. It's more of what's the collaborative. But I think most listened to artists were the Foo Fighters for the second year in a row. And I think the top listened to album this year was the new Imagine Dragons album, which kind of shocked me. I wouldn't have guessed either of those as that because I'm not calculating in the office request. I'm doing what I'm listening to mm -hmm. outside of work. But not that I enjoy both of those, not that I'm not listening to them outside of it but yeah. i guess that's a decent decent quick secret yeah, yeah. So. my and my personal most listened to song was uh was uh topo chico and lime by i think robert ellis the texas piano man uh. <laughs> i don't know i don't know i think it was just on a lot of playlists i listened to but i listened to it 33 times so my most listened to i do song, really like the song my most listened to song which you will appreciate was August is falling. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. If you don't know the band, you got to check them out. Yep, yep. So, but uh, Tyler Childress uh, was in my top five radio stations. Oh, good for you. So. You finally got some taste in music. There you me. go. There so, you go. All right. Well, that's our secrets today. We really hope you enjoyed listening to us babble on and on and get a little punchy at times, but, yeah. and, uh, and not too much political, but yes. a little bit political. Uh, with that, I'm Tom Knezic. And I am Fran Chismar. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you again, everyone. Woo. Uh, coming up next week, we have Dr. Peter Groffman returning. So uh, make sure you tune in for that. We'll see you again next time. And until then, keep it native. Thank you for listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planted Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Remember to like, share, follow, and comment.